Emma, the, a maternity unit is very, very different to some of the other environments that uh, gas and air entinox um, are, are used in, like endoscopy. Very, very different. So is that a part of the one of the or one of the barriers to implementation? Thanks, Vivian. I mean, I think you're right. It's an environment that there's a much stronger view on um, becoming more normalised. Uh, you know, not all labour wards are the same. Um, and maternity units, I mean, certainly my own maternity unit has two completely distinct areas where one will be a, a bigger rooms where this technology is much easier to implement, but also almost in at odds with that is introducing something that feels like a piece of medical equipment. So I felt like the, the greater barrier was just the, the visual on having a large, seemingly, uh, you know, medicalized piece of um, technology moving into an environment that was very much about mobility, about low sounds, low kind of a, a, a much bigger space to move around in um, and where you you didn't actually rely on medical equipment for your birth experience, where you were much more empowered to 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 avoid all of those sorts of things and actually have much greater choice in how you were going to go through your labour and use analgesia. So I, I kind of immediately knew when we got our units that there may be obstacles and that actually seeing how this might play out in a busier more active side of the delivery suite might prove to be harder because the space was much tighter. I mean, the other side of that is also um, how do you how do you um, articulate the um, the benefits um, to a very busy group of people who are very short staffed? Um, and how do you deliver training that is meaningful without it feeling like you're asking them to do a lot more? So I think for me, it was the space, but also, you know, uh, how to create um, a learning environment with, within a busy labour ward, I think, have, have been the, the biggest challenges for me. I mean, a bit like, um, sorry, go on. No, no, I was going to say, and, and how noisy is it? Because you, if you've got something that looks a bit like a generator in the corner, you expect it to make a huge noise. It well, I think that's the bit. You, you wheel them in and um, and I think everyone expects it to sound like a, a you know, a, a, a massive generator going on and they are pretty quiet. They're, they're silent and I think that becomes a huge surprise to the people using them. Um, and the other bit that came as a surprise, although we haven't done as much work as Cliff has clearly done in terms of the obstacles of glasses, um, is that the anaesthetic face mask, again, was seen to be a very, very medical thing. It was so at odds with the training around using mouthpieces that that was felt to be um, something that felt like you're really, really are pushing your luck here in terms of trying to implement this. But actually, people have surprised themselves. They've actually, the women haven't really had any issue at all with um, a face mask in the much smaller group of people that we've used them in so far. Um, and so far, they haven't really noticed that even a piece of equipment is in the room that shouldn't normally be there. So it's so far so good. But it, I, I did feel that it was us. We were potentially destroying that environment by having a piece of equipment like this, but it hasn't proven to be the case so far. Now, in the UK, we use a lot of gas and air and, and that actually makes us a bit of an outlier, doesn't it, across uh, Europe? And we seem in the UK, I mean, perhaps because of good old Humphrey Davy, but we seem to have this cultural affection for gas and air. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, this was a at the turn of the century and, and prior to that, this was um, something that was part of a party. Uh, you know, uh, nitrous oxide has a, has a reputation and was then coined as laughing gas for a reason. Um, so its introduction into society was very much around it not being something to be feared, but something that was quite enjoyable. Um, and I think overall, we have not had the same kind of view, I think, as potentially the United States around it being a medical gas outside of anaesthetics, you know, as an anaesthetist, and I'm sure my colleagues here will attest to, this was very much part of, and I'm possibly a bit older than them, a part of my training, you know, nitrous oxide with an anaesthetic had many, many uses, um, and it was the mainstay of older anaesthetic agent use. But I think we've moved on from that within anaesthetics, but it, the, we, we have kept nitrous oxide because it is so versatile. And I think Andy outlined that quite well. It's portable, it works quickly, it wears off quickly, and it creates a really great adjunct to breathing techniques, which have become a much 
bigger part of women's um, plan for birth analgesia. And it's almost seen to be not a medicine. In other words, mm. it's just a bit of extra support. Now, one thing I, I think which isn't elephant in the room uh, for me is that um, when women are in the middle of uh, labour, environmental focus is not at the top of their mind. <laughs> There's a lot of very blue language in maternity units. <laughs> and the idea that you could suggest that, you know, you're not having your gas and air because actually it's bad for the planet might not go down terribly well. No, and I think um, I agree with the, the use of the language that Cliff had on his um, unit. I think this is something that you can talk, well, we should be able to talk about, but I don't think it's at the time when you're in labour is the moment at which you start to introduce the idea that maybe you want to think differently about this. It may be something that we can introduce into um, our classes, but it may not be something that is as black and white as you shouldn't use it. And I think the other speakers have alluded to that as well. Um, I, I think education is at the core of this and I think as much um, women and their birth partners as well as our staff and with that knowledge and with that understanding I think we might find that we start to reduce some of that nitrous oxide use and actually if we, we might start to ask questions about what resources we need within a delivery suite to enable women to have the experience that they need but without necessarily using as much nitrous oxide because what we're doing here is obviously breaking nitrous oxide down, whereas actually at the top of our waste hierarchy, when we look at interventions within sustainability, we really want to reduce things first. So um, we want to make sure our waste processes and everything around leakage of nitrous oxide within pipe work, which Andy talked about, have all been managed as well. And um, so we need, I think we need to let women know that we are doing all of those other things too, and that taking nitrous oxide away from them isn't the only thing that's happening. So there's a very clear message coming uh, from you and indeed the other speakers that you cannot pile this responsibility onto labouring women. You know, it has to be it, it, it has to be sorted out for them, um, if you like, uh, before. And what I'm also getting from you is this sense that education, both of uh, the midwifery workforce and in, in advance and also with women is essential you know, whatever has been done in terms of effectiveness, unless you sort out the education, this isn't going to get implemented. Yeah, I mean, I think without that, it's very difficult for any of us to understand what tangible difference this makes, because we talk in very technical terms about carbon dioxide equivalents and car your carbon footprint. And I think we are fully immersed in this as people who are um, trying to lead in different areas of this work. Um, but actually it doesn't mean very much because you don't see a difference in what happens to you as a woman in labour and you don't see a difference in what happens to your baby in labour and those are your fundamental priorities. So I think that it's, it's all of us working together and sharing, you know, within forums like this that will prove to be, I hope, well, I hope prove to be helpful um, in, in working out what language we need to use because language is also so important in maternity. That's super helpful indeed. Uh, thank you uh, so much.